Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Andy Rich. I'm the Dean of the Colin Powell School. We're the School of Social Sciences here at City College and we're home to the college's public service and leadership development programs. And it is um, my pleasure to welcome you to this, our fourth annual Stanley Feingold Lecture on American Politics. Today, it is Speaking Truth to Power, a conversation with New York State Attorney General Letitia James. I want to apologize for our delay in getting started. We had a few troubles with the Zoom links, but we've got everybody here and ready to go now, and we're really looking forward to a good and important conversation. New York is at a crossroads. We are at the tail end of a pandemic that has upended the state's economy and our public health systems. It has exacerbated inequalities in our city and our state, and it has isolated many of the most vulnerable in our communities. We are in the midst of a reckoning on race in this country, in our state, and in this city, in the wake of police violence against Black Americans in a judicial system that does not seem to treat all people as equal under the law. And we're at an inflection point in our politics. We have a new governor, a new mayor, new paradigms and priorities for thinking about the role of government in people's lives, and important statewide elections next year, where our guests today will be on the ballot. This is a great moment to take stock and to consider the way forward for New York State with someone who has spent her career breaking barriers and quite literally, as the title of today's program suggests, speaking truth to power. Letitia James is the 67th Attorney General for the state of New York, the first woman of color to hold statewide office in New York, and the first woman to be elected Attorney General. Before becoming Attorney General, Ms. James was elected public advocate for the city of New York, and with that became the first woman of color to hold citywide office. She has been a trailblazer in public service at the city and the state levels, and she recently announced her candidacy for governor of New York State. She began her career as a public defender at the Legal Aid Society. She is a proud Brooklynite for which all of us here in Harlem forgive her. Um, and perhaps most important today, she is a CUNY graduate. Attorney General James is a proud graduate of Lehman College and of the Howard University School of Law. This conversation, this event, is made possible by a group of City College alums, many of whom are with us today, who care deeply about the politics of the nation and of this state. A part of their passion for politics is rooted in perhaps the one thing that they all have in common, and that is that they all had Stanley Feingold as a professor. Professor Feingold was a beloved and gifted professor of political science who taught at City College for almost four decades. He wrote about American politics, he taught about American politics, and he ignited a passion among his students over many generations to be active in the political process, to wonder about our political system and to be forces for good in it. This annual lecture stems from that passion and these alums came together some years ago to launch the event as a way to interrogate big questions about American politics and have conversations with some of the most important leaders of our time. We do it as a way to celebrate and honor Professor Feingold. I did not personally have the privilege to know Professor Feingold, but I feel like I did from the many stories we've had and heard from his students. And representing this group of alums, I wanna introduce Anita Altman, a 1967 graduate of CCNY and one of the leaders who makes the Stanley Feingold lecture possible, Anita. Thank you so very much. Um, well, you've, you've stolen my thunder on a few things, but um, the reality is when Stanley died in September of uh, 2017, there was such an outpouring from students from all over um, who were shocked, dismayed at his loss um, and who spoke in, you know, who wrote the most moving, um, you know, accolades of, you know, their memories of him and his impact. And so a group of us did come together to in fact um, figure out a way to honor him. And this annual lecture slash symposium is really, um, and it was made possible by the incredible enthusiasm of the administration uh, and for which we really are grateful. I would like to tell you a little bit more about Stanley. Professor Feingold was a passionate, dedicated teacher who was committed to his students. He intellectually challenged us, provoking us with hard, uncomfortable questions, forcing us to see other sides of our long held, one might say often smugly held views. In class, he never revealed his position. He and Professor George McKenna, who also had a long distinguished career here at the college, 
together published Taking Sides, Clashing Views on Controversial Political Issues, which provided readers with an opportunity to do the same. His commitment was to help develop critical thinkers, a capacity so desperately needed in contemporary America. He was to many of his students more than a teacher. He was a mentor, inspiring us to live a life with integrity and intellectual honesty, influencing, influencing many of us, including myself, to pursue lives of public service. He was also so committed to this college. When City College was closed down during the student strike in 1968, Stanley opened his home, which was then located nearby to the school to conduct his classes. Trusted by students and the administration alike, he was called in to help negotiate a, resolu a resolution to the shutdown. Years after he retired, for almost two decades, he would travel from his home in Seattle five times a year to meet with former students, now long established in their own fields, to continue over brown bag lunches, those scintillating, challenging discussions about the current state of the American political landscape. You can only imagine what fodder the 2016 election of Trump provided for us, and of course, especially feel his loss during this frightening time when the very survival of our democracy is in question. It was only then at these lunchtime discussions that we learned his real political opinions, which were passionately felt, but for all those years in the classroom, carefully restrained from sharing. Moreover, he continued to write and we were blessed to receive his many opinions. Over time, he wrote a significant body of essays which revealed his humanist, progressive perspective that challenged many conventional wisdoms. This event is being recorded and we're delighted that the college will be sending to each of you a link to the recording as well as to the compendium of Stanley's writings. Finally, on behalf of my fellow alums, I want to express our profound appreciation for the enthusiastic support of President Vincent Boudreau to Didi Mozaleski, the executive director of the Foundation for City College and a senior advisor to the president and to our very own Dean Andrew Rice of the Colin Powell School, who have really made it possible to honor our beloved teacher, something that would have been very meaningful to him with this annual Stanley Feingold Symposium. And of course, we are so grateful to New York State Attorney General Leticia James and Ralph Blumenthal, a prize winning former reporter for the New York Times who got his start in journalism as the editor of City College's campus newspaper. My only regret is that Stanley isn't here to participate in what will no doubt be a fascinating session. And for, for him to receive this honor at this institution, he so dearly loved. Thank you very much. Anita, thank you uh, very much uh, for those heartfelt words. And I, I wanna mention, I, I see it in the chat. We, we do hear the feedback as well, and we're trying to figure out how to, how to eliminate it. Uh, but we hope that while it's a little bit there, you can mostly hear what we're what we're saying, which is good. Um, I want to thank the whole Feingold Lecture Committee, and I, I actually want to add special thanks to Sid Davidoff and to Paul Bergman. Uh, the two of them were really instrumental for us in putting together today's uh, program. So thank you to Sid and thank you to Paul. It is now my privilege to introduce Ralph Blumenthal, who is going to be our moderator for today. Mr. Blumenthal is an award-winning reporter. He was with the New York Times for 45 years, from 1964 to 2009. He, he led the Times Metro team when it won the Pulitzer Prize for breaking news coverage of the 1993 truck bombing at the World Trade Center. He has written seven books on organized crime and on cultural history, and he is now a distinguished lecturer at Baruch College. But he started at City College. He was a 1963 graduate of City College. He was at least in the orbit of Professor Feingold in his years here, and he served as the editor of the student newspaper, The Campus. He is going to lead us in a discussion with our guest today, and then we'll have time toward the ends for a Q&A. And I want to encourage folks to use the Q&A, which is open, as you can see in the chat. We'll pull the questions from there uh, for Ralph to pick from during the Q&A period. Um, as as uh, Anita suggested, we are joined today as well by CCNY's president, Vince Boudreau, and um, President Boudreau will share closing remarks at the end of today's event. So Ralph Blumenthal, Letitia James, thanks for, again for being with us today. And let me turn it over to the two of you. 
Thank you so much, Dean, and thank you, Attorney General James, for joining us this very fateful year and eventful year for the Stanley Feingold Lecture Series. Uh, you exemplify the public service that Professor Feingold dedicated his life to studying and celebrating, and we want to cover a lot of ground. You have a very full history, so if you could keep your responses as tight as possible, we'll get more done and leave time for questions. So first of all, I know you're a proud graduate of uh, City University, Lehman College. Uh, how important was CUNY in your career? And what commitment would you make to uh, the system uh, as governor? Uh, for example, how about rolling back tuition? <laughs> first, let me just uh, thank you for this opportunity. And again, I apologize for the, uh, the technological difficulties. Um, I'm a proud graduate of Lehman College, um, and there's a number of individuals, a significant number of individuals who attend CUNY who are first graduates in their family. Um, and it's so critically important that we continue to keep the doors open, that we keep tuition low. And so as the governor of the state of New York, when I become governor, I look forward again to ensuring that um, there's opportunity, educational opportunities for all. Access to education is really the key to success. Um, and I stand as a proud graduate of CUNY as a result. Thank you. Thank you. So first of all, what is it with you Brooklynites? I mean, there's mayor-elect Eric Adams, that you running for governor, a public advocate, Jumani Williams, also running for governor, Representative Hakeem uh, Jeffries, maybe running for Speaker of the House. Uh, is it something in the Kings County water that's new? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, no, let me just say, uh, as a proud Brooklynite, I represent the entire state of New York, and I look forward again to representing all of its constituents um, as I run for the office of governor. Um, I am from, you know, as a proud, you know, Brooklynite, um, it's important that individuals understand. I believe that this is one state, not downstate, not upstate, but one state, and the issues are basically the same, whether you're from Rochester or whether you're not, or whether you're from Brooklyn. So what do you make of this explosion of firsts? I mean, you're seeking to become the country's first black woman governor, uh, cha challenging New York's first female governor, Kathy Hochul, Jumani Williams would be the first black speaker of the house. Uh, I mean, the first black elected governor of New York um, and Hakeem Jeffries would be the first black speaker. Is this a special moment um, regardless of the rivalries? Well, let me just um, correct you. David Patterson was the first black governor not elected, elected. Not elected. Yep, that's <laughs> absolutely true. Um, but again, all of these firsts mean absolutely nothing to me. Um, they're nothing more than historical footnotes. The question really is, uh, what do you do with the power that's in your hand? And there is no rivalry between Congressmember Jeffries, public advocate Jamani Williams, or any other individual uh, within our community. Um, I believe in democracy, and I believe that everyone has the right to vote, and all of us should present our credentials and allow the voting public to decide. Okay, thanks. Um, so how would you rate the biggest problems facing New York State, which you'd face as governor? Uh, what would your top three priorities be? And what if the Supreme Court throws out New York City's gun law? Um, uh, There's a lot in that question. There's a number of issues yeah. in that question. Um, we're at an inflec inflection point. And the question is, how can, we, um, how can we move forward in the state of New York? And how can we exhibit fundamental change? We are at an inflection point and we anticipate that there'll be additional federal resources coming to the state of New York and we cannot uh, return to normal. As we, um, as we recover from COVID-19, it's really critically important um, that we do it in a fair and balanced way and that all voices are heard at the table and at the, at the seat of government. It is absolutely critically important. Um, and so um, I look forward again as the, uh, governor of the state of New York to exact uh, fundamental change uh, to ensure um, that the recovery funds, um, that the Build Back Better funds are distributed in a manner which can increase the middle class um, and can address a number of issues all throughout the state of New York, including child poverty, including homelessness, and including individuals who are struggling with mental illness. So your three priorities would be the president's new program, Build Back Better, and what infrastructure else? program, the infrastructure program, so that we can uh, again provide capital funds um, to create um, uh, and improve our infrastructure. We can improve broadband in upstate New York. We could provide a much needed affordable housing, much needed supportive housing. We can address the opioid crisis. Um, there's a number of things that we could do with uh, the Build Back Better funds, as well as the infrastructure funds, 
um, but it's really critically important that we do it in a, in a way that all voices are represented at the seat of government. And we, uh, again, put forth fundamental change in the state of New York. Um, there are so many issues uh, that we need to address, including the feminization of poverty all throughout the state of New York. Women should be paid the same um, as men for basically doing the same job. We need to ensure um, that individuals do not have to work in toxic environments um, and then that the rights of women are respected. So let's talk about your career. In your 10 years in the city council from Brooklyn, of course, uh, yes. you expanded uh, the recycling of plastic, uh, tech clothing and textiles. You worked to improve conditions in housing and were instrumental in uncovering the city time payroll scandal. Um, how enduring really were these successes and what are you most proud of? I'm most proud of the fact that I was the city council member who led the effort to provide school lunch for all children in public schools. Um, previously, as you know, low-income children had to basically present themselves um, as being below the poverty level, um, and they had to stand, in some cases, on a separate line. Um, I did away with all um, distinctions between individuals who were, below, who were below the poverty level and those who were not. The only distinction that I wanted to learn about was individuals who were hungry. We now have in the city of New York universal school lunch where all children in the city of New York can eat free lunch regardless of their economic uh, standing. Um, I'm very proud of that. I'm also proud of the fact that we uncovered the biggest scandal in the city of New York known as City Time, recovering $500 million for taxpayers. And lastly, I'm very proud of the fact that I stood up against Mayor Bloomberg um, when he wanted to extend uh, the third term. I'm really proud of that as well. And also was a city council member who filed a, and joined with others in filing the lawsuit to stop the abuses related to stop and frisk. And the list goes on and on and on. Um, as in, order to be the, in order to be the governor of the state of New York, it's going to take courage. And each, at each, each and every step during my career, I have um, exemplified and exhibited um, courage. Um, and as a proud uh, graduate of CUNY, each and every student that you teach is someone who has exhibited courage. We come from humble beginnings. We have often been um, unassuming and overlooked, um, but it's now time that we rise and again, uh, present ourselves and uh, put forth fundamental change for New Yorkers who have been left out of the sunshine of opportunity. Thank you. Um, as Attorney General, you also brought suit against ExxonMobil under the Martin Act, uh, barring deceitful practices that cheat uh, shareholders. But the judge in the case called your, your case involving the proxy cost of carbon uh, hyperbolic and uh, the case basically fell apart after four years of investigation and millions of pages of documents. Looking back, is there anything you might have done differently? This case was first filed under my predecessor, the attorney, attorney General Snyderman. I inherited that case, but nonetheless, I took it on because I believed in that case. Um, and because I believe that they in fact were deceiving um, their shareholders. And as someone who believes in testing the law and pushing the laws to its limits, I'm proud of the fact that, we've, that we stuck with that case. At the end of the day, um, there are other jurisdictions um, in this country that have filed similar cases, but it's based on a nuisance claim. Um, and we again uh, sued, as you mentioned, under the Martin Act. And, um, I am proud of the fact that um, our office filed that case, even though we were not successful. It's really critically important that individuals understand that the law um, is both, uh, should, be both as a, should be used both as a sword and as a shield, and we should fundamentally test the law and test it, test it to its limits, particularly in light of the fact that I believe in science and I believe that climate change is real. But, I mean, do you think the Martin Act, in, again, in retrospect, hindsight, uh, might not have been the right uh, grounds to bring that to? I believe that the Martin Act was the correct case, but I also believe that we, all, we should also consider the possibility of seeing viewing it as a nuisance claim as others have done. Okay. Um, so let's talk about your campaign for governor. So far you've been trailing Kathy Hochul in the polls. Uh, is that a matter of concern to you? No, not a, polls really don't matter to me. The, um, at the end of the day, the only poll that matters is election day. As you know, I just announced my election less than three weeks ago, um, and I'm surprised that I'm just uh, a few points below um, half Kathy Hochul, but in terms of my favorability, we are basically equal. Um, we are staffing up. We will be announcing our campaign manager soon. We've been announcing a number of endorsements uh, as well as unions, um, and again, the best is yet to come. I mean, didn't you just announce your campaign manager with Gabrielle uh, Say? 
We just uh, announced it within the last 24 hours. <laughs> okay, tell us about her and why you chose her. I chose her because she was the formerly the political director for 1199, probably one of the most powerful unions, if not in the state of New York throughout the country. And because of, abil her, because of her ability, uh, again, to organize grassroots organization. For me, this is really about um, organizing individuals on the ground. It's about extending our tent and it's about, about speaking to individuals um, about issues that they care about as I did when I was a city council member as public advocate and now as the attorney general of the state of New York. It's about, um, again, uh, felt issues um, and issues that people care about um, sitting around their kitchen tables and not, um, and mostly as a, an elected official listening to um, uh, uh, voters and, a listen, and listening to um, New Yorkers about the concerns that they have. So this would be a sign that union support is uh, critical to you? I have been a supportive, I have been very supportive of unions because I recognize that the unions, the labor movement and the union labor movement um, and the middle class are inextricably tied to one another. And I also recognize that the reason why we have a weekend off is because of the union movement. The reason why we have women's rights, the reason why we have children's rights and the reasons why we have uh, um, labor um, uh, rights with respect to uh, workers is because of the union movement and I support them each and every step of the way. And I look forward to receiving quite a bit of love, labor support during this campaign. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about your path to victory. Um, obviously- let me, also, let me also just say that as the attorney general, we've also uh, been able uh, to get, um, get millions and millions of dollars for workers as a result of misclass misclassification in individuals who have been violating the rights of workers. We've returned millions of dollars to workers who have been harassed, um, who have not been provided overtime, sick leave, et cetera. It's really critically important that we stand up for workers' rights. Um, so uh, the five boroughs can elect the governor probably, but not probably, uh, mathematically by themselves. So how important is the rest of the state to your, uh, to your path to victory? So I'm gonna leave that to the pundits. The reality is that every part of the region, every part of the state of New York is really critically important unto the role of governor. And it's important that you just not look at downstate, that you look at upstate as well. They have significant issues and concerns. And so as the governor of the state of New York, I will be addressing the issues of all New Yorkers, just as I have done as the attorney general suing a previous administration 76 times on environmental abuses, on reproductive rights, on immigrant rights, on census, on salt, state and local tax. Um, and when the administration declared uh, New York state um, as a sanctuary state, uh, basically depriving us of um, uh, federal funds for law enforcement, we have consistently defended the rights of New Yorkers each and every time. And I will do that as the governor of the state of New York, just as I have done um, as the attorney general. Again, it demonstrates courage. It, de it demonstrates the ability to stand up to power and to speak truth to power. Uh, regardless of the circumstances is because no one is above the law. Okay. Now, Louis Miranda has been a key political consultant to you going way back. Um, he's of course the father of Lynn Manuel Miranda. Uh, how much are you counting on him to mobilize the Latino Hispanic vote? For me, again, it's again, speaking to every constituency in the city of New York. Um, the problem with what's happening now in our country is that individuals tend to separate us based on artificial constructs such as race and ethnicity. I want to unite New York. New York. I want to heal New York. I want to bring individuals together and talk about issues that concern all of us. But uh, uh, there seems to be a Latino gap so far, uh, even in the uh, mayor-elect uh, prospective cabinet. Uh, is that something that you feel a special need to remedy in your campaign for governor? Um, it's important that all voices are heard at the seat of government and that everyone is represented at the seat of government. It's not about checking off boxes. It's about, again, it's about representing the interest of New Yorkers. And that's what I have done as the attorney general, as public advocate, and as a city council member. Um, again, I don't believe in artificial constructs. I believe in results and getting things done and doing it in a courageous fashion, unbossed and unbought. Okay, so where are you on a running mate? I mean, the New York Post uh, just reported you were considering Suffolk County exec uh, Steve Ballone. Uh, what can you tell us? Make some news. Um, uh, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not going to make some news. We are vetting a number of individuals and I dispute that article in the New York Post. You saw it? I dispute it. You dispute it, okay. Um, 
So um, how is your race for governor affecting your attorney general duties like your investigation of Andrew Cuomo and the Trump organization? I mean, at some point uh, during the campaign, you'd also have to resign as AG, right? So those causes would, uh, you'd have to abandon them. No, not at all. I don't have to abandon my position by no means. I can walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, and there are several hours in the day where you can do a lot. I work 24 hours, seven days a week around the clock. Um, I don't have, uh, unfortunately, as my mother says, I'm tragically single and I have committed my life to public service. Um, and so I love the Office of Attorney General. We will, consider, we will continue our investigation into the Trump administration and the Trump organization and Donald Trump himself. We will continue our case against the NRA. We will continue our case against um, standing up on behalf of women's rights and reproductive rights. We will continue our cases uh, against um, big tech we will continue our cases against all those who engage in scams against consumers. Um, and, we'll, and we will continue our case against those who violate the Martin Act. Um, and at the same time, I will uh, campaign and present myself before New Yorkers. I believe most people are familiar with my work as the attorney general um, because we've been courageous and we've been able to get things done and we will continue to do that as the next governor. And I will continue to serve out my post as the attorney general of the state of New York until December 31st, 2021, at the same time campaign for the um, office of governor. So you would not have to resign before the election? You would not have no. to resign? No, by no means, just as Governor Hochul doesn't have to resign, I don't have to resign either. Okay. Um, so um, you mentioned your uh, investigation of the Trump Organization. There was some speculation recently that things are coming to a, a head now that uh, we're getting very close. Can you tell us anything about uh, the, the timetable? No, I cannot comment on active investigations. I didn't think you would. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, how do you uh, how do you counter the any perception that investigating the sexual harassment charges against uh, allegations against Governor uh, uh, Andrew Cuomo, then governor, uh, served your own uh, political ambitions? Well, you have to contrast my investigation to that of uh, the former governor. Um, our investigation was independent. Um, we basically farmed it out uh, to two firms. They did an excellent job. Their re resumes and their reputations are beyond dispute. They engaged in a, um, an investigation, an exhaustive investigation with thousands of pieces of documents. And our investigation was corroborated by the most recent report that was released by the assembly just yesterday. I believe this is nothing more than an attempt to undermine our investigation and to politicize it. Uh, but the investigation is concluded, it speaks for itself. Individuals can read the report. We've released the transcripts. It's on a rolling basis and we'll, we will continue to um, release more information with respect to our investigation. And I stand by that investigation and I believe the women. And lastly, let me say um, again, this is probably the uh, opportunity uh, to, I think I'm uniquely qualified to serve as the attorney, as the governor of the state of New York, because again, I can see based upon the number of cases um, that we've had to defend as the attorney general, that there is much needed change on a statewide level. We pay out um, millions and millions of dollars in judgments as a result of the failings of state agencies because they're understaffed, poorly trained, and they lack a vision. Um, and so I am uniquely qualified having reviewed and having done a risk assessment of all of the agencies that it's really critically important um, that you have a, a governor um, who can, uh, again, provide fundamental change, um, transformational change in the state of New York. The time is now. There's not been much change uh, on a state level for some time. It is needed now more than ever. And I, we cannot accept the status quo because we cannot return to normal after following COVID-19. It requires change and it requires someone who has the courage and the demonstrated courage to get it done. Um, when you ran for uh, attorney general, um, you spoke highly of um, Bill de Blasio uh, for mayor who was running then. Uh, whether or not he, he joins the race for governor, uh, how would you rate his tenure at city hall? Um, no comment on um, Mayor de Blasio. I believe the voters um, will uh, basically make a, uh, will cast judgment um, on um, the tenure of Mayor de Blasio. Um, I will not, and I will leave it up to the voters of the state of New York, assuming that he does run for the office of governor. 
Right. But I mean, you were pretty effusive in his support then. Uh, the fact that you're not commenting now, could that suggest that you've changed your opinion? No, um, I think at this point in time, I believe um, his uh, tenure speaks for itself and the voters ultimately will decide. We've had four years um, to make a, de a determination as to his performance. Um, and um, I leave it up to the voters uh, to make that decision. Well, eight years, right? Eight uh, years. <laughs> uh, felt like four years went fast. <laughs> um, well, it was, well, the comments that I made were four years ago, so. Okay, um, so you have a strong record as New York State Attorney General, so why leave now? Uh, be, I mean, is eight years too long to wait to try again for the governorship? So, so you know, it's funny that you say that um, because so many, all throughout history, um, individuals have been told to wait. Women have been told to wait. People of color have been told to wait. Um, Dr. King was told to wait. Um, waiting is not an option at this point in time. It's important to present yourself um, to the voters. Um, it's important that we allow democracy to take place. Um, I believe in democracy. This is not about one candidate versus another. This is about giving New Yorkers a choice, an option. This is about fundamental democracy. Um, how about uh, any interest you may have in national office, uh, say, for example, United States Attorney General? Is that a job that may appeal to you at least at some point? I'm running for the office of governor. I'm running for the office of governor because I have all, th all throughout my career made a commitment to public service and I've demonstrated courage and I've demonstrated results at every office. In the office of city council, taking on Mayor Bloomberg when he wanted to extend term limits, filing again, being a plaintiff in the lawsuit against the police department for abuses related to stop and frisk, undercoving the biggest scandal in the city of New York known as City Time as public advocate, again, asking the pension board to divest from fossil fuels and we were successful, to divest from gun manufacturers, we were successful, passing a law which basically says that you cannot ask individuals their prior salary uh, because the feminization of poverty is real and because um, gender inequality is a major issue um, and women should be paid what they're worth as opposed to what their previous salary was. Um, and then passing more laws as public advocates than all previous public advocates combined. And then as the attorney general of the state of New York going, filing a, a lawsuit against powerful individuals, the most powerful individual in the United States and the most powerful, and again, engaging in an independent investigation against the most powerful individual in the state of New York, standing up to the NRA, um, standing up to big tech and standing up to powerful interests in the state of New York. New York State needs someone who is courageous and someone who is not afraid to speak truth to power. And individuals should judge me based on my performance. Uh, you, you just started to answer that question, but let me delve into that a little deeper. What do you think people that don't know about you that they should know? And what would you like them to know? Um, that um, one, that um, uh, I love to work. I love the law. Um, I love government. I believe in public service. Uh, and it would be um, a ch chance of a, of a lifetime to serve as the next governor of the state of New York um, and to make history as well. And what, what would you say influenced your decision to, to go for governor most? Um, again, from this vantage point as the attorney general, viewing state agencies um, and viewing how at this point in time, uh, we need to transform state agencies um, there are a number of agencies uh, that are understaffed, a number of state agencies that need additional training, they need new leadership, um, uh, that we need to focus on uh, commissions and public authorities, uh, that we need, again, to work, uh, have a better relationship with the state legislature, um, that we need ethics reform, campaign finance reform, we uh, need to, uh, again, uh, focus on environmental concerns, um, uh, uh, divesting from fossil fuels, um, engaging in alternatives um, uh, to energy, focusing on solar, uh, focusing on um, uh, uh, reproductive rights in the state of New York, focusing on voting rights, uh, joining with others to pass voting rights on a federal level. Um, the list goes on and on and on how we could basically um, enact uh, a transformational change in the in the state of New York, providing for um, children, addressing child poverty in places like Rochester, where, ch where child poverty 
um, is one of the highest in the nation, uh, focusing on issues in Buffalo where we've got lead in, in pipes where um, as the attorney general, we've brought a number of cases against landlords um, in uh, Buffalo because of lead paint um, and children who, who unfortunately um, have been exposed to lead paint and nothing has been done about it. In Syracuse, where we've got a critical housing crisis, um, the opioid crisis where I've brought actions and brought cases and um, have resolved um, litigation against five manufacturers and, and distributors and the Sackler family resulting in a $1.5 billion settlement where I've been visiting um, counties all throughout the state of New York, uh, where unfortunately there is no economic base other than um, the misery of opioids. We can and must do better in upstate New York and all throughout the state of New York where counties have been ignored for far too long. We again are the most prosperous and richest state um, and to travel in upstate New York and uh, to see the level of indifference and to see how government has not partnered with some of these counties, um, I think is a tragedy. And we as a state can and must do better. We must provide opportunities for individuals, again, to be a part of the middle class. We must provide opportunities to create economic engines in upstate New York. We must, again, address the needs in New York City and on Long Island and in suburbs where the middle class is being strangled. Uh, we must, again, um, address uh, environmental degradation throughout the state of New York. There are just so many issues that have been ignored and we cannot just respond to crisis after crisis. We must, again, think big, bold, brave ideas in the state of New York. And that's what I will bring to the table because I've already done it as city council member, member, as public advocate, and as the attorney general of the state of New York, where we, again, have defended and protected democracy, not only in the state, but all across this country. I have been a bookend, again, protecting and defending democracy, standing with California and other big states. And New York has been the model. And it was my honor and my privilege to represent the great state of New York. And I will do it again and again as the next governor of the state of New York. It takes courage, it takes strength, it takes leadership, and it takes a bold and big vision. Thank you for that. Um, so we have a lot of students watching, City College uh, students now, who are looking at you and thinking of themselves in the future, wondering perhaps uh, how you got into politics, uh, you know, what were the decisive steps, you know, on your path, and uh, what advice you'd have for them. So there's a lot of CUNY students out there and SUNY students out there who might be listening. Listen, you've got to believe in your passion, um, and you've got to follow your heart, and you can't live for anyone else. And so this is your time to step out of the shadow um, and uh, to step into your own and to think big and to recognize that the power really lies in your hand um, and to recognize that every and all changes um, begin at the ground, uh, begin with people. And so I urge all of you uh, to step into your own um, and to believe in your dreams and to believe in your passion. And what steps uh, were instrumental in your, in your path to public service? I uh, was a, an attorney, a public defender. I represented countless number of children in the criminal justice system and also, and also victims of domestic violence. And I recognized that the power really was in politics. And that's why I decided uh, to run for city council um, and then ultimately to run for public advocate now as attorney general, because I recognize the law can both be, should be used and viewed as a sword and as a shield to represent and to um, stand up for vulnerable and marginalized populations and families that were struggling, particularly working families in the state of New York. Okay, um, so let me ask you, do you expect to run to the left of Kathy Hochul uh, in the campaign? I, I expect to run um, to achieve results for New Yorkers. Um, I don't wanna, I don't allow individuals to place me in a box, left or right or center. Um, I'm all about getting results for New Yorkers. What would you say are the issues that differentiate you from Kathy Hochul? I'll leave that up to the voters to decide. Again, I have a record of accomplishment, a record of getting things done, both on the local level and on the state level. And I, uh, again, from this vantage point as the attorney general can see how state government has failed New Yorkers. 
how our middle class is getting smaller and smaller each and every day, how there are no economic engines in upstate New York, how children are struggling with poverty each and every day, and how we are at an inflection point right now using, again, the infrastructure funds and the Build Back Better funds to transform New Yorkers and transform the lives of New Yorkers and to build out our middle class. Um, I'm looking, uh, Attorney General James, at the uh, chat box here and uh, some questions have come in from listeners. Uh, one is, uh, as a black woman elected official, what has been your single biggest challenge in public service and what lessons would you stress to emerging young leaders? And the second part to that question, uh, the country is deeply divided. Any thoughts on how we can bridge the dangerous political divide? So as a woman of color, we are often under, un, un, we're often under, under assumed, under assumed um, people underestimate our power, um, but we always rise to the occasion each and every time. Individuals count, uh, continue to count us out, uh, but we continue to rise up and overperform each and every time. Two, um, we are more divided now than we've ever been since the Civil War, and that's unfortunate. And what we need to do is talk to individuals who believe in things that are, who, who think differently from you, extend a hand and try to um, reach some commonality, uh, again, on issues um, that are wedge issues. It's really critically important that we all come together. It's unfortunate that we find ourselves divided, but I do believe that we can find common ground. And so I extend a hand to those, again, um, who are of a different political affiliation than I, um, who believe in, um, who are, who believe differently than I do, um, but I also, off, I also believe that we can find common ground and I've been able to find common ground with individuals um, who, who don't support my position on a number of issues, uh, but ultimately believe that there's only one way um, to remove garbage. There's only one way to keep our streets clean. There's only one way to keep us all safe. There's only one way to keep lights on. Um, and when you can find common ground and on those issues, then you can probably find common ground on others. So who are your biggest influences? Who are your mentors? Um, I've got a number of mentors, but obviously Shirley Chisholm uh, was someone who I looked up to. Um, uh, I looked up to Barbara Jordan, um, who again served on the judiciary uh, during the impeachment hearings of Richard Nixon, um, who talked about our democracy. Um, and who said that we had an obligation and a duty to stand up for our democracy and not allow anyone to subvert our democracy. And so um, as someone who stood up against the previous uh, president um, and um, who believed that he oftentimes attempted to subvert democracy, who did not believe in our institutions um, and someone who challenged us as a nation, uh, particularly during the insurrection on January 6th, um, I can relate to Barbara Jordan quite a bit. And oftentimes I find myself, and I found myself during those challenging days to read a number of her speeches and to be inspired by her. And talk a little bit about your, your um, growing up. I mean, what influenced you as a child? What did your parents tell you about public service, if anything? Uh, what lessons did you draw from, from your upbringing? So um, I grew up in Brooklyn, I grew up in humble beginnings but I also grew up in church and I am, uh, I'm a woman of faith and I am taught each and every Sunday about righteousness and about equality and about believing in others and about standing up, even if you have to stand alone. Uh, we, we, did your parents uh, influence you at all in, in a public career? They, my parents told, talk, talked to me a lot about uh, standing up, being fair, being honest, hardworking um, and representing the interest of those who have been uh, historically ignored and locked out of the sunshine of opportunity to stand up for those without and to share each and every day. And I attempt to do that. Um, and again, not to judge anyone um, and not to um, uh, believe in stereotypes, uh, but to recognize the humanity of all of God's children. And I do that every single day. Hmm. What kind of a relationship do you have with the mayor elect? Um, uh, Eric Adams um, is from Brooklyn. Uh, I've known Eric Adams for a very long time and I look forward to the administration of Mayor Eric Adams. Um, you think you can uh, get along better than governors historically have gotten along with mayors? I tend to get along with um, everyone. I get along with Republicans, I get along with moderates, I get along with progressives, 
I get along with every, everyone. Again, finding common ground. So uh, Governor Hochul was recently endorsed by the county chairs, the state democratic chairman, president of the NAACP's uh, New York State Conference. Does that make your campaign more challenging? I've been endorsed by TWU. I've been endorsed by a number of elected officials in Brooklyn, elected officials in upstate New York, um, and anticipate um, additional endorsements going forward. I've been endorsed by uh, Higher Heights and, and been endorsed by uh, a number of other organizations. Um, and again, uh, at the end of the day, it's really about um, grassroots organizing, and I look forward to engaging in grassroots organizing all throughout the state of New York. Um, and did you hope that Jamani Williams would not uh, get into the race? Jamani Williams is a friend. I've worked very closely with Jamani Williams. At the end of the day, it's really about running my race and focusing on issues that New Yorkers care about. Okay, so um, we're sort of getting to the end of uh, the time and um, questions that I have prepared. I know there are many questions out there. I've looked at a couple in the chat. I know that there are people who would like to um, uh, ask questions directly. So uh, at this point, um, uh, Dean Rich, if you wanna uh, see what the questions are out there or we can continue this way, whatever you'd like to, uh, to continue. Um, so actually, um, folks don't have the ability to unmute and be heard. So we have to ask the questions that are in the chat. Okay. So I see uh, I'd be happy here. to have. Uh, I see a few more. Uh, how do you envision integrating our schools in New York State, especially New York City, that is the most segregated school system in the country? How are we going to make sure there is equity in resources and funding in schools? Excellent question. Um, and as most of you know, we just recently settled a case. Um, on the state of New York, with, which would provide um, equality and equity to schools all throughout the state. And I have um, the distinct advantage of representing um, as a former city council member, District 13, uh, where we were responsible uh, for providing um, more diversity in our schools in District 13 by experimenting and providing more by providing additional programming and additional resources in School District 13. And in fact, School District 13 has been the model all throughout the city of New York. And I look forward to doing that as a governor of the state of New York. Again, getting things done, it's results. Uh, what do you feel about the gifted and talented program? It occurs to me to, to ask you, is that something that should be phased out? No, I support the gifted and talented program, but I think all, all schools um, should rise to the level of gifted and talented, um, uh, should use gifted and talented programming. So each and every school in the, in the city of New York and all throughout the state of New York should benefit from gifted and talented programming. Um, we should provide additional resources to those programs um, and gifted and talented, again, should be expanded all throughout the state of New York, but every school should be a gifted and talented program, but it requires, again, being a visionary, it, it requires a leadership and it requires um, equitable funding. And again, as the attorney general, we just recently settled the case, a campaign, um, a, uh, the campaign for fiscal equity uh, lawsuit um, and it was done under the leadership of Letitia James. Huh. And, and Ralph, I think we have time for just one more question from you and then I'll come in with, with the last okay. question. Um, gee, there's so many good ones. <laughs> um, uh, here's a self-serving question. Will you commit to substantially increase financial support for CUNY as it's the greatest <laughs> engine for upward mobility? And you've got to well, be mindful of your audience here, Ms. James. Well, I, I think you said it right. It's a self-serving question, but it's something that obviously <laughs> Obviously, it's something that I'm I am interested in, and as a former CUNY graduate, um, obviously it would be a priority. It's really critically important that educational access for all individuals uh, be available, and that we provide as much funding as possible. Um, education is really the key to success and the key to equalizing um, all New Yorkers. It would be a priority in, in the administration of Letitia James. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, Ralph. Thank you very much, Ralph. Very much for your questions. Uh, Attorney General James, this has been an extraordinary conversation. We've learned so much about you. And I guess I, I wanted to ask you if I might, as a very last question, we do have a lot of students um, in our audience today who I, you know, the Colum House School is about encouraging young people to be inspired to go to public service and to be public service leaders. And I wonder if you could say maybe a little more about kind of how you got your start and what advice you'd give to young people today who are thinking about the really difficult but, but extraordinarily rewarding path that you have taken. Public service is a noble cause. It really is a noble cause when you can uplift individuals and when you can make a difference in the life of someone else. When you think about others before you think about yourselves. 
I wake up each and every day and the question is, how can I improve the life of another? Um, I've worked all of my career, uh, again, trying to transform lives. Um, and I urge um, CUNY students and SUNY students to do the same, um, to enter into public service now more than ever, uh, particularly at a time when our nation is divided, particularly at a time uh, when individuals need to see the goodness of public service and to recognize that gov government is there to make a difference in your life. And so many individuals, so there is so much apathy right now in New York and across our nation. And we can change that. You and I can change that. We must change that because government was instrumental in my life, just as government was instrumental in yours. So please join me. Please join me in the campaign to, again, um, create fundamental transformational change in the state of New York. My name is Letitia James, and I look forward to serving you as the next governor of the state of New York. Thank you. All right, Attorney General James, thank you very much. And thanks for inspiring others. Ralph, again, thank you to you. And, um, you know, as I say, the Colum House School really is a place where we both teach the social sciences and do research in the social sciences, but we think a lot about leadership and public service. And the person who helped to put all of that in place at the Colum Powell School is the first dean of the Colum Powell School and now the 13th president of City College. And I wanna turn it over to him for closing remarks, President Vince Boudreau. Thank you, Andy. And, 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 and thank all of you who've been so instrumental in convening uh, th this conversation. Um, I have a, I have a um, Stanley Feingold story as well. Some of you have heard it. Um, Anita uh, referenced the book that Stanley would do every year with George McKenna. And as a young assistant professor in the Department of Political Science in the early 90s, uh, I, I would sneak past the conference room where, where George and Stanley were arguing in person what they would later argue in their book. And, and believe me, I tiptoed because if Stanley saw a third party you would be brought in, whether you liked it or not, as an arbiter of their, of their, uh, their dispute. Um, Stanley would have loved this series. Uh, he uh, was a tireless advocate of bringing consequential conversations, bordering on debates into the classroom. And, 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 and so, you know, you who have been his students um, in, in supporting and convening and organizing and, and participating in the production of these annual Feingold lectures, you, you have done um, probably the most appro appropriate thing you could possibly have done to memorialize his legacy, his legacy in your lives, his legacy in this institution, his legacy in society. I, I should say Stanley would be as proud of you as you obviously have been through the years of him. And so thank you for the work that you've done uh, here. Um, uh, Attorney General James, we have um, been really privileged to, to, to hear you speak today. And, and, and just if I could, one more sort of city college uh, political science story, if, if, if I can. I became the chair of the political science department around 2000. And it was a moment when we could look at state and local and city governance and see a generation of city college graduates uh, aging out of public service without uh, any kind of notable bridge into public service. Um, and so the Henry Stearns, for instance, and, and uh, were, 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 were coming out of city government. And so we and a number of young faculty that, that that I was privileged to hire, including uh, at the time, Dean Rich, we started thinking about how to rebuild the pathway from CCNY into governance. Uh, and, and we really are at a kind of remarkable moment where, you know, not just thinking about City College, but thinking about the entire CUNY system. Um, you, you said it directly, have alluded to it in other places. We as a university system are saying it more and more but the, the, the institution, City College, CUNY, that has for years provisioned the workforce of the city is, it is now really and truly beginning to flesh out the positions of, of authority and, and, and significant power in, in, in policymaking. And, 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 and I think that has something to do, certainly it has a great deal to do with the quality of the education we do at, at, at this college and, and across the system, but it also has something to do with the way that electoral politics 
is, is changing and, and, and providing opportunities for, this is a phrase that, that you know, was uttered at our founding. I love it. I think it's, it's in the, the spirit of, of, of this college and this university system, but, but a politics for the whole people. Uh, in, in, in the same way that we are educating the whole people. And so if it's not presumptuous to say that on behalf of that, of that effort, it, it has been just a real thrill to watch you in your career as a proud and vocal CUNY graduate take on some of the most significant cases um, in the city and, and, and in the state. And, and, and so I want, I, want to, I, I want you to know that the um, half a million, you know, current students, faculty, staff of CUNY um, has eyes on you, and 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 it's been a real, it's been a real thrill to 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 watch you um, go out into the world and carry the legacy of this institution forward. So so thank you, in, in you know what I know is an absolutely hectic moment for you personally and on on on, on both the political and, and and the policy scale for making so much time available to us. I wanna thank the people at the Colin Powell School that work really hard with the Feingold uh, group uh, to put this lecture together. And, and, and all of you who spent a, a little bit of time today uh, listening to um, what Stanley would certainly have considered an exceptionally um, consequential conversation. Ralph, thank you for your work today. Anita, for your introduction. And of course, Dean Rich for, for shepherding us through this hour and a half. And I will finally uh, end once again with Attorney General James. We are so grateful for your time and your attention here today. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. President Boudreau, thank you very much. Attorney General James, I, I add all the same thanks and I just wanna wish everybody a very happy Thanksgiving. Thanks for a good conversation and we look forward, we're gonna be posting this in the near future. Um, so we'll share the link and uh, we'll also share the links to uh, Professor Feingold's writings. Have a great evening and thanks so much. Thanks everyone. Happy holiday, everyone. Happy, happy holiday. Thank you.